Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness is an Arr, swash, swash, buckle, buckle. simulator released in 1995 for PC and Mac by Blizzard Entertainment, and in 1996 it received an expansion called Beyond the Dark Portal developed by the now defunct Cyberlore Studios. It's everything the previous game was with larger, more detailed graphics, new units, structures, missions, terrains, and most notably the inclusion of naval warfare as well as a couple of airborne units on top of the traditional ground combat. There's even a level editor and multiplayer mode built right into the game. The game has drastically been changed, and your strategy will have to change along with it to keep up with all the new elements you now have to keep in mind. So the question is whether or not these changes are worth it and how well they work out. How does this game compare to its predecessor? Well, before we can get into answering those questions, we've got a sizable backstory to catch up on. Once again, the prologue for the game is tucked away in the game manual, but it's mostly just a synopsis of the events leading to and during the First War, and fleshes out some of the key characters with some flavor text. It's a decent read, and I recommend you go through it in its entirety if you're curious, but as before, I'll do a quick rundown for the gist of it with those lovely MS Paint drawings I know you all love so much. So if you're not interested with the story and want to get to the actual game, feel free to skip ahead using the annotation on the screen. If you haven't watched the previous video, I recommend you give that a watch right now, if only to get yourself up to date with the story and see how things have changed between games. As a reminder, the stories are told by in-universe characters, so the possibility that certain details are misrepresented or flat-out fabricated still exists. Medivh's mother, Eoghwyn, is actually the leader in an order of guardians whose role is to protect their world from the great dark beyond, a sort of plane or power through which evil beings and magics can transcend through and gain access to terrible powers and travel to other worlds. After a little more than a thousand years, she decides her role as matriarch of the order is coming to an end, so she finds a suitable male and has a son to pass on her guardianship to. She transferred her powers into Medivh, but when it came time for those powers to unlock, he was overwhelmed by it, corrupted and twisted by the power he now possessed. Then the events of the First War unraveled. It's now confirmed that Garona is the one who killed Lane, and the Orcs won the war by destroying Stormwind by driving the humans out. Night Lothar is the one who takes the throne for the Azerothian peoples, essentially meaning the character that you played during the first game doesn't exist, or at best means that much of the human campaign and ending exists in an alternate timeline. Anyway, Lothar leads an exodus of the Azerothian people into Lordaeron, where he counsels with King Terranus. They eventually receive aid from the dwarves, elves, and other men from the land, putting aside past grievances for each other in order to come together against the new common threat and thus the Alliance was born to combat the ever-growing Horde. And that's basically all the backstory we get for this game, although we also get a hefty bit of backstory for the creator and the leader of the Shadow Council, an orc warlock named Gul'dan. Gul'dan was a lowly orc shaman learning magics from his master Ner'zhul, but Gul'dan was more ambitious and aspired for much more. He didn't care for his fellow orcs, only for absolute power. Through his training, he learned of the Great Dark Beyond, and he learned how to project himself into it where he met the demon Kil'jaeden, and began to learn of much greater and terrible powers through him. He eventually became the most powerful warlock the orcs had ever known. The orcs were rowdy and self-destructive, however, and Gul'dan decided to gain control of the masses. Through sharing his knowledge with other powerful warlocks, he carefully and systematically gained control over all the orcish clans. He and a select few of his trusted apprentices formed the Shadow Council in order to hold every orc under their control. But since the orcs had raised and ruled over every bit of land on their own world, there existed a restlessness that not even Gul'dan could control. But that's when a presence probed its way into their world. Gul'dan chased after this strange presence that was so powerful it even frightened his master Kil'jaeden. When he finally confronted the presence, it was revealed to be a powerful human sorcerer named Medivh. Gul'dan and Medivh formed a sort of pact where Medivh would give them a new world to conquer, and Gul'dan would use the Horde to destroy Medivh's enemies. Gul'dan wasn't entirely satisfied, however. Their relation was nebulous, but when the orcs discovered the portal and gained access to Azeroth, Gul'dan was able to press Medivh for further reward. Medivh persuaded Gul'dan to help him, and in return he would divulge the location of the Tomb of Sargeras. Sargeras was a demon lord and Kil'jaeden's mentor. Medivh's mother defeated him, and supposedly his tomb contains the power that could turn a mortal into a living god. Gul'dan accepted, but as we all know, Medivh was slain and the location of the tomb was lost. Gul'dan was searching through Medivh's mind during his last moments, but found nothing, and as Medivh's ethereal mind died, Gul'dan's mind was heavily damaged and went comatose for quite some time. During which time, Blackhand was assassinated and the Orc Horde's power was usurped by none other than your character from the first game, now known as Orgrim Doomhammer. And we reach our first major retcon. Previously, we were told that the Shadow Council assassinated Blackhand and that they appointed Orgrim as Warchief, but now it's revealed that Orgrim did it all by himself. Anyway, after Orgrim rocks the Shadow Council's boat, he learns of their existence and begins weeding them out and executing its members. Once Gul'dan awakens, he confronts Orgrim and pledges fealty to him in order to save his own life and research. Orgrim reluctantly agrees on the condition that Gul'dan will create for him an undead army. Gul'dan, along with the few remaining Necrolites, begin working on creating that army to no avail. 
In a last-ditch effort, Gul'dan sacrificed every last one of his followers in order to channel their powers to raise the spirits and corpses of the Azeroth Knights, which he infused with the spirits of his followers, and thus the Death Knights were born. And so now Gul'dan bides his time serving Orgrim, waiting for his opportunity to regain his power and search for the Tomb of Sargeras. And that's that. There's actually a bit more story for the expansion, but I'll go into that when we reach that section of the review. Again, it's a neat story that adds some nice backstory to the characters and locations in the game and helps expand past and current events. Good, fun, solid fantasy narrative where you can explore if you want, but isn't strictly necessary to enjoy the game. Speaking of the game, how's about we finally dig into that? It begins with a short CG cinematic that basically boils the entire story down to the humans flood across the sea and the orcs are chasing them. Because forget all that nonsense from before, reading is for pussies. Anyway, you are once again a nameless, low-ranking, invisible, omnipresent general figure, ordering your troops around to build a base and defend said base, while you rally the troops required to eliminate the enemy base, or accomplish some other similar objective. As with the last game, the further you progress in your campaign, the more units you and your enemy unlock. The big twist in this game, of course, being the naval combat, which I'll get into shortly. I think I can safely sum up this game as being more or less the same as the first game, just with more stuff added onto it and a fresh coat of paint. But there are a few things which have changed on a fundamental level. The first change being that you can select up to 9 units at once. Hallelujah. It's maybe not as many as I wish it was, as sending an army to zerg rush your opponent can still be quite finicky, but it is miles better than 4, that's for sure. The AI is still dumb as a post. They still have poor pathfinding and have difficulties figuring out which enemy they should be hitting, and it honestly feels like it's the exact same AI as the first game. They may have a few more features here and there, but by and large, moving and arranging units is a hassle if you want any sort of precision. The Fog of War is present once again, only this time it's accompanied by a second fog, which lets you see the terrain, but not any enemy units. This semi-fog appears when you've explored an area, but none of your units can see what's over there anymore, which adds a bit of realism and uncertainty to the map. You can turn it off if you want, which is what I did, because this game can be tricky enough without it, and you can save resources by not having to scout out every location all the time. Base building has remained mostly the same, you still need to send your peons or peasants to collect resources in order to finance buildings and additional units. In the first game, however, all the buildings had to be connected by a road, but in this game, roads have been removed completely, which is a change I very much welcome, since it allows for an easier and more tactical advantage to how you build your base. Your only restrictions are the areas of land which can't be built upon, like mud or shorelines, and since you're no longer constrained to a tiny corner of the map, it makes the additional gold mines actually worth a damn. Walls are removed as well. Uh, sort of. Walls still exist, you'll often see your enemy barricaded behind them, or using them to hold some of your units hostage, but neither you or your enemy can actually build them. I never really built walls myself in the first game, so in reality not much has changed, but it definitely feels like the enemy has an even larger advantage than they already had, and it probably would have been more practical to be able to build walls in this game than it was in the first. The final new addition is guard towers, which depending on your other buildings can be upgraded into archery towers or cannon towers. Since they don't require food, have a large health pool, act as blockades, and the archer towers have much higher damage than normal archers, these babies can be extremely useful for repelling enemy attacks. The only downside being that they're stationary, but since they're buildings, that means they can also be repaired in exchange for some resources. Towers are a blessing and a curse, because they can be a massive use for your base, but as a result are also just as helpful for the enemy, and can be a hell of an annoyance to deal with. Before, if you routed all the enemy enforcements out of a camp, destroying their base was a simple act of charging your units into the center and speeding up the game while they did their work. Now you need to tiptoe your way through the base and pick off each of the towers with a major ballista before you can tear the rest of the base apart. As useful as they are, they ultimately slow the game down quite a bit, and as a result, I've grown to dislike their inclusion somewhat. Other than those few changes, base building is the exact same as it was before, using buildings to make new units available, as well as researching methods to strengthen and unlock different attacks. However, upon the open seas is a new resource which you'll have to extract as well if you want to finance the building of ships. This new resource is oil, and you'll have to build an oil platform before you're able to extract it. Oil is used for purchasing other ships, buildings, and researching stronger attacks, so it's just as precious and necessary as the other resources on the missions that include a naval element. Apart from oil platforms, any nautical-related buildings, of which there are three, need to be constructed along the coastline, but apart from that, they function the exact same as their earthen counterparts. If you wanted to get your land units across a body of water, you'd have to build a transport ship which can carry up to six units, and if it gets sunk, everyone on board will drown with it. The other ships involve a standard type warship, a slower but beefier warship, and a stealthy submarine that can avoid detection from the other two ships and must be spotted by an aerial type unit or an enemy sub before it can be attacked. The light ships can attack aerial units, but apart from that the ships are only good for attacking other ships and for cleaning up coastlines for your ground units to land on. 
The utility of the ships are fairly dull in comparison to the wide array of ground units you're given access to, and in some ways they feel like a dumbed down version of the game as a whole. There's only one unique resource and three ships that can attack each other. Supplementing your gold and lumber to finance your navy more often than not feels like a waste of resources since you've also got to worry about your land base. In a perfect world, the boats would split your attention so that you have to focus on preserving and growing your naval and land base, but in reality they just add more steps between your base and the enemies, which is more often than not the main objective. Once you've decimated the enemy's naval capabilities, you've pretty much won, but this is still Warcraft and you still need to pump more time and more resources into building and carrying an army to wipe out the enemy base. And once your ships have outlived their usefulness, there's no way to get the resources you've sunk into them back. They just sit out there in the open seas, completely ineffective. The best you could hope for is to lure the enemies toward the coast, but that's hardly ever necessary. Quite frankly, if you couldn't tell already, I'm not really a big fan of the boats. They feel like they pad out each mission, and the sea just feels like it keeps getting in your way. One small body of water could mean you have to build up to three additional buildings and up to two non-combative units just to get across, all the while spending precious gold and lumber that could have gone elsewhere. Forgive the pun, but there's almost no depth to the naval warfare. It's never very difficult to combat the enemy since they're always spread out and all you need to do is build up a fleet and steamroll them one by one. I should mention that the boats can be and are used effectively in some missions, and I'll touch on that a bit later. But the large focus and reliance on them in the base game is just a tedious bore and hardly adds much of anything to the game that couldn't have been done in a similar manner with the previously established systems. But let's move away from the boats for now. There's once again a human and an orc campaign, and as before, each faction shares the same units with slight alterations to some stats and abilities. For example, elf archers can unlock an ability which adds plus 3 damage, but the troll archers can unlock a passive but slow heal over time. Each campaign is structured the same way, in that you will progressively unlock more units as you complete each level, but the missions themselves aren't quite as similar to each other anymore. So the first few missions of each campaign are still fairly parallel to each other, but as each story arc progresses, the missions tend to get a bit more unique and varied, unlike the first game when they were just mirrors of each other, and the campaigns have more of an identity than they did before. I actually prefer the human campaign, since it has fewer naval missions and a more diverse range of scenarios than the orc campaign, and I would recommend playing that one first if you ever decide to give this game a try. The campaigns also have a very smooth difficulty curve, and thanks to all the new additional units you have to keep in mind, the difficulty has gone up overall, and you'll find yourself with a decent challenge for the final few levels. Though some missions seem to feel like they rely on you getting lucky enough for the enemy AI to break and get all their forces stuck behind some trees or something, or forget about your presence entirely. But aside from the clunky maritime warfare, it's all still Warcraft, and the missions that don't include boats are still some of the most enjoyable in the series so far. The one thing the seas do help to bring to the table is a more creative level design. In the first game, if you controls the bridges, you controls the universe. But now the levels are much bigger and more open, and any land bridges there are will rarely give you any advantage for holding them. The audio quality has gotten a much needed boost. There are multiple voice actors and sound effects for each of the units now that each faction consists of multiple races. And of course, each type of unit has a different annoyance dialogue if you click on them enough. What? <laughs> that tickles. He did it now, he did it. Say hello to my little friend. Don't force me to run you through. Are you still touching me? Even elder races get tired of waiting. Stop rocking the boat. You're making me seasick. I forgot to mention the critters earlier. They only serve as watering scenery. But there's a neat little easter egg if you click on them a bunch too. To get back on track, the music tracks are also higher quality, although I gotta admit only one track really caught on with me, and that was one of the human tracks. So for most of the time the music wasn't all that interesting or enjoyable, it only served as background noise. But given the amount of time and thought and attention that this game demands and how much you'll be listening to these tracks on loop, that's not exactly detrimental. They're all perfectly serviceable, and none of them are flat out grating, so there's really not much to complain about on that front. If you stop to consider the fact that this game came out only one year after the original did, it's quite remarkable what they were able to accomplish. Every department except for maybe the AI got a huge overhaul in production value, and they really pushed the capabilities of the series. The game asks quite a bit of time and mental fortitude to be played, and as a result failing a mission is immensely demoralizing. Some of the final missions of the game can take you multiple hours to complete and can wear your patience very thin. Though that may be because of my playstyle. I usually like to take the time to hunker down in one position, gathering as large an army as possible, and then slowly marching forward in a manner that mitigates losses as much as possible, and I have trouble focusing on more than one or two things at a time. Quite honestly, it's the boats that ruin the game for me the most. They make most missions there are needlessly tedious and annoying, especially when you have to fly around the whole map looking for that one submarine you missed, or there's a griffin camping out on the only oil spot and there's not jack shit you can do about it. But again, any missions without boats, or at least a minimal focus on them, are really quite enjoyable, even if some of them require quite a heavy time investment. 
But that's why God invented save states. And hey, with the level editor, you can make as many scenarios as you want to suit your preferred playstyle. And an online element with a community that still has active members to this day can definitely keep you coming back for more. So that's the gameplay. But what about the events of Warcraft 2? What stories to be told between these campaigns? Well, I'll tell you. First, I'll remind you that the orcs destroyed Stormwind, and the humans have fled across the sea with the orcs chasing after them. Bear in mind, these are just simple summations. If you want to hear the mission briefings in their entirety, then you can watch a compilation I made here. If you also just want to skip the story entirely, you can go ahead and click on this timecode. Anyway, these are the events of what is known as the Second War. On the human side, Lord Terranus orders you to build some farms. Deja vu. The elves wish to join the Alliance, and you're tasked with rescuing some captured elves and enlisting them to your army. With the elves a part of the Alliance, they also offer their destroyers. Admiral of the Fleet, Dalen Proudmore, orders you to build a shipyard to accommodate them. You're tasked with destroying a secret orc base in the Zuldair region. You reclaim the island of Tobarad and destroy the orc base at Dun Modra. You destroy another orc base at Dun Algaz. Scouts have discovered the main oil refinery operation of the Horde and you're tasked with destroying all of their platforms. With the orcs now retreating from Cosmodon, you're stationed at a base in the Northlands called Tyr's Hand, where you must quell a peasant uprising to destroy all the orcs in the region. You're tasked with escorting the paladin's captain, Uther Lightbringer, to Ker Darrow so that he may assist those afflicted by the war. Some soldiers of Altarak are found to be traitors and you're tasked with escorting them to Strathome for them to be interrogated. It's now revealed that Lord Paranold of Altarak has been working with the Horde from the very beginning. He was responsible for the captured elves and the peasant uprising at Tyr's Hand. You must free the innocent soldiers of Altarak and destroy their capital. With Altarak destroyed, the orcs begin retreating. After discovering the orcs' main naval base, you're tasked with destroying it so that the orcs will not be able to escape. Some of the orcs manage to escape to Blackrock Spire in order to rebuild. You're tasked with going in and destroying them. Again. But, before that, Lord Lothar ventured into parlay with Dewhammer, but had not been heard from for quite some time. And in an event that actually takes place during gameplay, you witness Lothar and his party being slaughtered by the Horde before slaughtering them yourself. And finally, the remaining orcs rally to protect the Great Portal that brought them to this world. You're promoted to commanding all the armies of Lordaeron in order to destroy the remaining orcs as well as the Dark Portal itself. In the final cutscene, a mage who we later discovered to be some guy named Khadgar destroys the Dark Portal and the humans achieve peace at last, and the few remaining orcs are allowed to flee with the threats of the Horde finally ended. For now. As for the orcs, Doomhammer orders you to build some farms. Deja vu. A troll commander named Zul'jin is captured. You're tasked with rescuing him to put the trolls in your debt. Zul'jin offers some destroyers, and you're now tasked with building some oil platforms. With your new toys, you're tasked with destroying the human settlement of Hillsbrad to show your dominance. You're tasked with retaking Dun Modra and destroying Tol Barad. An ogre mage named Cho'Gal comes to inspect your refineries. You're tasked with escorting him through Cosmodon safely. With the inspection of success, you're tasked with destroying the human city of Stromgard. Gul'dan desires the use of an elven artifact known as the Runestone. You're tasked with destroying its protectors and claiming it for Gul'dan. Gul'dan uses the Runestone to create ogre magi and tasks you with using them to assist building a fortress at Tears Bay to choke the human supply lines of Quel'Thalas. You're tasked with destroying the human's main oil source of Stratholm. Gul'dan releases his death knights to destroy the elven city of Quel'Thalas. Gul'dan betrays the Horde in order to pursue his goal of opening the Tomb of Sartorus, which he achieves. You make your way over to eliminate the traitors, demons, and Gul'dan himself. Three cheers for this random troll who laid the killing blow. Doomhammer releases his dragons for use in the destruction of the city of Dalaran. You destroy the human capital of Lordaeron. And for the orc ending, Doomhammer promotes you to the rank of Warlord, and the orcs roam free, pillaging as they wish and celebrating their domination of the entirety of Azeroth. So, once again, there's about as much story in the missions as there was in the first game, which is to say, practically none, especially compared to the manual. But regardless, that's Warcraft 2. And you won't have to wait long to find out which of the endings was canon, because four short months later the expansion was released and revealed that victory belonged to the humans this time. Perhaps the only thing in the Orc campaign that remains true is the opening of the Tomb of Sargeras and the death of Gul'dan. So with that in mind, we can swiftly move on to Beyond the Dark Portal, and thankfully, it won't take quite as long to go through as the main game. So without delay, we'll slide right on in with... Beyond the Dark Portal's backstory isn't nearly as long as the main games, but there are a few noteworthy events that I'll go over quickly. Members of the Alliance go out to destroy whatever remnants of the Orcish clans that are still roaming around. Doomhammer is captured and imprisoned under King Terranus. The high members of the Alliance debate and argue about what is to be done with the surviving Orc prisoners, some thinking they should be executed and others believing they should be given life sentences. King Terranus was hoping to form some kind of treaty with Doomhammer, and the incessant arguing caused several members to withdraw from the Alliance. 
One specific orc clan, known as the Bleeding Hollow, was suspiciously missing, and one day, Watchmen guarding the Dark Rift are overcome by a darkness and vaguely hear the marching of orc troops but are helpless to do anything. Kilrog, the leader of the Bleeding Hollow clan and powerful sorcerer, is able to temporarily open the rift for his clan to retreat through. Gul'dan's old master, Ner'zhul, is now the leader of all the orcish clans in the orc homeworld of Draenor, and Kilrog meets up with him so that they may begin planning and strategizing their new assault on Azeroth, and to plan to open new portals to other worlds. And... that's all there is to it. Not much to say about it either way. It just helps fill the gaps for the interim between the main game and the expansion, so thankfully, we can jump right into the gameplay. And in the Department of Gameplay, eh, not much has changed at all. Beyond the Dark Portal is a simulator that gives you a new tile set for the Orc homeworld of Draenor, and two new campaigns which are 12 missions each, with a majority of your units already unlocked from the get-go. So instead of only being able to play around with the large variety of unit types for the final few missions, you get a whole lot more content to play around with them all. Since the enemy also has access to these units and the game loves to place you at a severely disadvantageous position, this has the effect of making nearly all the missions incredibly, enormously, ball-bustingly difficult. Be prepared to fight three fully-fledged armies all at once while you start out with only a couple peons or peasants in your tiny slice of territory. This expansion pulls no punches and it will test your tactical ability to the absolute limits. That is, if you're just an average Joe Schmo like me. I can't speak for experienced RTS players, but you will fail these missions a lot. And given that each mission can take more than an hour or two to complete, you've got to have the patience of a saint and an iron will to make it through them all without activating cheats. Many missions start you off with a free scout, but the fog of war will be tremendously irritating. Some missions will require trial and error simply for the fact that it's impossible to know where your enemy is and what they're capable of. And with some missions as down to the wire as they are, you can't afford to lose units just because you went the wrong way. But aside from the difficulty, there is one major inclusion that Cyberlore Studios contributed that would affect the future of Warcraft, Blizzard, and many games in the future, and that is the inclusion of hero units. These guys are just your average units, but with their own names, portraits, voices, and massive stat and health buffs. They serve as super units to help combat the enemy, and they must survive the missions they appear in. To be fair, Tides of Darkness sort of had hero units, but they only appeared in one mission each and had negligible stat boosts. The heroes help make missions more interesting and vary the gameplay up a bit. Some of them have some major story relevance and, of course, a bit of comical dialogue. You never touch the other elves like that. You think Lothar's death was my fault, don't you? Do you feel lucky, punk? Do you like fire? I'm full of it. This is the reason I ended it all. Stop that incessant clicking. Overall, their inclusion is a positive one, and it's no surprise they'll be carried over into Warcraft 3. The missions themselves of Beyond the Dark Portal are a step up from the base game. The focus on naval warfare is significantly reduced, and any missions that they do appear in are often brief and or unobtrusive. These are the kind of uses from the boats that I actually really enjoyed, like this one where you're at the beginning and you need to blitz the enemy and set up a base as quickly and efficiently as possible, and once they're destroyed, you can sink your own boats for food, safe in the knowledge that you won't need them anymore, and it didn't cost you anything because the mission starts you off with them. Now, you've still got a couple traditional naval base levels, and there are a lot more missions that take on a lot more classical design, but many more missions feature unique objectives such as destroying one enemy or a building in particular, or merely making your way to a specific location without dying. The expansion builds on the base game in a worthwhile manner, with some really neat and enjoyable additions and missions. However, due to its strenuous difficulty, I would not recommend it unless you're up for a serious challenge. The base game will sate your Warcraft thirst just fine and offer up a decent challenge to boot. And well, there's really not all that much more to say about it, honestly. It mostly feels like what would happen if the main game just kept on going, and while I'm not such a big fan of the difficulty and the time investment that some of the missions pose, I can imagine veterans of the genre could find something to appreciate about it, and some of the levels are genuinely enjoyable despite their difficulty. So now I'll just go over the mission stories, and then we'll get this video wrapped up. So first off, both campaigns start off with the cinematic of Khadgar destroying the Dark Portal, but there's an additional scene where it's revealed that while the portal is destroyed, the rift connecting the two worlds still remains. That's how Kilrog and his men escaped back to Draenor. Once again, if you want to skip this part, or view the full mission briefings, just follow the link on the screen or in the description. With that out of the way, we'll start with the orcs this time. Ner'zhul discovers how to reopen the Dark Rift and has you hunt down some Death Knights who also share this knowledge, and are under the command of a rogue ogre mage named Mogor. 
On top of that, you learn an orc leader named Grom Hellscream has been taken prisoner by them. It's your job to rescue Grom and kill the rest. Grom's a hoot, by the way. Welcome to my nightmare! I am my Feelings! Take it! Nerzul sends you two heroes, Dentarg and Korgoth Bladefist, and you're sent to retrieve the skull of Gul'dan from the Bone Jewer clan, so that it may be used in the ritual to return the Dark Portal. Two clans, the Thunderlords and the Bone Chewers, are trying to return to Azeroth on their own. You're sent to destroy them for their hubris, and so Nerzul can remain uncontestable. The leader of the Death Knights, Teron Gorfin, allies himself with Nerzul, and with their combined efforts succeed in reopening the rift. Your mission is to destroy the battlements built on the other side. The orcs lost control of the dragons during their initial defeat, however it's revealed that they still roost at Black Rock Spire. You're ordered to make your way to and ally with the dragons. A new castle was built upon the remains of Stormwind Castle, and a powerful artifact known as the Book of Medivh is said to be held there. You are tasked with destroying New Stormwind and claiming the book for Ner'zhul. The Book of Medivh is missing, and evidence links that Alterac may be responsible. Before you can get to Alterac, you must build a strong naval base and destroy the humans' naval base. With the Great Sea under your control and Admiral Proudmore seceded from the Alliance, you are tasked with destroying his remaining navy and raising the city of Kul Taras. Since Ner'zhul was Gul'dan's mentor, he had their spirits linked so that he could keep tabs on Gul'dan. Thusly, he knew everything Gul'dan was up to and what he desired. So he sends you to make your way to Sargeras' tomb and to claim the jeweled scepter of Sargeras. After making contact with Alterac, they agree to give you the Book of Medivh on one condition, that you eliminate the military outposts along their borders. You do so and escort the mage protecting the book to your base. Yet another magical artifact is desired by Ner'zhul, this time the Eye of Dalaran, which is capable of concentrating magical power. You make your way over to where it is held and destroy the base protecting it. One of your dragon buddies named Deathwing informs you that the Alliance is attempting to retake the Dark Portal. It's your duty to destroy the human resistance and safely return all the artifacts to Ner'zhul so that he may open many more portals to many more worlds. For the orc ending, you are highly revered by Ner'zhul for your efforts, and with all the artifacts in hand, he opens a rift that leads to a world known as the Twisting Nether. Ner'zhul has his and your warriors enter the Nether and abandon the Shattered Hand and Warsong clans that remain in Azeroth. And on the human side... Khadgar, the mage that destroyed the Dark Portal, senses a dark omen from beyond the rift and feels another attack is imminent. You are tasked with gathering two heroes, the Paladin Turalyon and the Mercenary Denath. Assisting you is an elven ranger named Alaria to help collect as many reinforcements on your way to New Stormwind. Surprise, surprise, the orcs rebuilt the portal and start invading again. They're also aided by the dragons already with the help of Deathwing. You and Denath are sent to eliminate the orcs attacking the Citadel of Nethergard. You are tasked with retaking the Dark Portal, but rather than destroy it, Khadgar has you merely capture it so that he may divine the true intentions of the Orc invasion. Some elves inform you that the Book of Medivh has been stolen from New Stormwind by Ner'zhul. Khadgar now realizes Ner'zhul's plan to open more portals, and you are sent through the Dark Portal to reclaim the Book of Medivh, so you destroy the Orc camps immediately surrounding the portal. You are tasked with building a strong naval fleet and destroying the Orc shipyard of Zethkur. With some intel from the Griffin Rider Kurdran and Alaria, you're tasked with raising the forces of Alkandun and retreating in order to cripple some of the orcs' forces without getting destroyed yourself. Kurdran is captured by the orcs and Khadgar makes his way into Draenor. He and Alaria travel to an island where Kurdran is being held and also where the skull of Gul'dan is being guarded by Deathwing. You go in and rescue Kurdran, kill Deathwing, and claim the skull. Alliance forces have been struggling against the Horde and your only hope is to retrieve the Book of Medivh. You are tasked with destroying the enemy coastlines of the mainland that will lead you to Ner'zhul and the Book. You must destroy the Shadowmoon Fortress and claim the Book of Medivh so that Khadgar can close the portal once and for all. Ner'zhul and the Book are nowhere to be found in the wreckage. You learn that the orcs are attacking your base protecting the portal at Hellfire Peninsula, and you leave to protect the base from the orcish attack. The Laughing Skull Clan requests your help in destroying some of their opposing factions. In return, they will give you the Book of Medivh which they took for themselves before you could. They offer their warriors, and you actually primarily play as the orcs for this mission. Even with the Book of Medivh in Khadgar's possession, Ner'zhul had learned enough from it to open a rift to the Twisting Nether in Draenor. After seeing Ner'zhul and his armies escape into the Nether, Draenor begins to crumble from the power caused by the opening of the rifts. Azeroth is also at risk of being torn apart due to the connection of the Dark Portal. You must lead Khadgar to the Dark Portal and protect him from the Horde so that he may use the artifacts to destroy the link between the two worlds forever. For the human ending, the portal is successfully closed and destroyed, and Azeroth is saved from the destruction of Draenor. Because of this, Khadgar and your men are now trapped on the dying world. Before Draenor can rend itself apart, seeing no other alternatives, you all make your way to one of the rifts and venture forth into the Twisting Nether. Now, that's the kind of story I've been hoping for. Not only does each campaign tell a bit of backstory and forward the plot, but they're also both compatible with each other, so all the events of both campaigns are canon. Well, for now. 
It sets up room for a sequel, and it fleshes out some of the characters, albeit marginally. I'd also like to think some of the story elements are what made some of the missions so unique and enjoyable. Like how one of the missions says you have to destroy a base and then retreat, you do actually have to make your way back to the starting point before the mission can end. It's something the base game was sorely lacking, and really elevates the expansion in terms of what it does for the narrative and gameplay. But with all that covered, we can finally begin to bring this review to a close. Warcraft 2 is a flawed game, just as its predecessor was. It's got more bits and bobs, like assigning hotkeys to speed settings and patrolling units, but in place of old headaches, some new ones pop up in their places, like how sometimes a blister around will just disappear. It looks better, sounds better, plays better, but whether or not it's a better game than the first one is mostly subjective. The first game is much simpler and easier, but clunky and a bit bland. Warcraft 2 streamlines and expands the gameplay in good and bad ways both. Neither game is really all that bad, or all that good, but Warcraft 2 definitely allows you to play any way you wish with the map editor and multiplayer, which by itself can make it the superior product. My personal opinion? Well, honestly, I didn't have as much fun playing this one. It was long, it was tedious, it was frustrating, and it got to be rather monotonous at times. Again, that may be because of my playstyle. My refusal to switch tactics very often, and my tendency to have the game run at a snail pace so that I can make efficient actions were no doubt a detriment to my enjoyment. But especially in the expansion, the game gets so nightmarishly hard, and by the time you squeeze out a victory, you're stripped of all your progress and sent down to the beginning for the next mission. There were times where I literally just bulwarked myself into an impenetrable defense and waited for the enemy to run out of resources because they were almost impossible to take out otherwise. I thought I was playing Warcraft, not a tower defense game, and it's difficult to ascertain whether or not that's bad game design, because in the back of my head I had to keep asking myself, maybe I just suck. Because when it was possible to hold the tactical advantage and go through a mission quickly and efficiently, it feels really good. But if you're a first time player like I was, you're gonna have to practice before you can expect to have much fun with it, unless you're a dirty, filthy cheater. This is one of those games that you would get and then play all the time until you got really, really good at it. You'd get your money's worth and more from this game, and you'd get hundreds of hours of playtime out of it. There were several expansions made by other developers, but they were mostly just additional levels with no real gameplay changes, which would have been nice if you enjoyed the game but weren't exactly the creative type yourself. So just because the main missions gave me hell doesn't mean I might not enjoy some well-crafted custom levels. The foundation is solid enough, the execution just didn't quite jive with me very well is all. Except for the boats, those are still mostly garbage. Oh yeah, that's right, I, um, t play Warcraft 2.